Good day. So good to be here with you again. And um, looking forward to spending some time here in the letter to the Ephesians, which we began our study with last week. And today, um, it's Mother's Day here in Canada, and we just want to celebrate uh, our mothers today. And we thank you, moms, for all that you do for your families. And we thank God for the blessing of mothers. And um, so if you're a mother and you're listening to this or watching this, happy Mother's Day. So last week we began, as I mentioned, our verse-by-verse study here uh, in the letter to the Ephesians. And we used the illustration uh, of mountaineering as we began last week our familiarization at what we call base camp. And today we want to cast our eyes up uh, on the goal up the mountains of God's glorious glorious grace as we try and answer the question, who is the church? This is challenging, and the the reason is is that since the very beginning of church history, many have misunderstood God's glorious grace uh, that uh, he has in place for the church. Last week, as we settled into our time at base camp and our preparation to ascend up the mountain, so to speak, we began to unfold the blueprint God has provided his people for what we need to know and understand about our place and purpose in the church. God has graciously and kindly provided for us, pardon me, in his holy Bible. And then here at base camp, where we have the thread and theme of Paul's letter, uh, clear, clear and crystal before us. The Apostle Paul, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, lays out for us our place and purpose in a church, word by word, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph through his letter. So on that note, please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, we're going to be uh, dealing with verse 3 to 14, but let's read it from verse 1 to 14. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you for this time that we can be together in this way, and I thank you, Lord, also for your word. And for the study we've begun uh, last week in the letter to the Ephesians. And as we begin to look at these 12 verses uh, in depth, a little closer, uh, we ask, Lord, that you help us by your spirit, not only to understand them, but to actually allow the word to uh, shape our hearts and our minds concerning the church and the Lord of the church, Christ himself. So we thank you for this opportunity. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as a starting point, uh, verse 3 to 14, 
Uh, we discover in the ancient Greek of the New Testament forms one long sentence. And it's quite a long sentence, uh, at least from the English side of the house. And of course, ancient Greek is exactly that ancient. However, we can say some things concerning this one long Greek sentence. As one commentator suggested, what we have here is an overture. And if anybody is a musician, which I am not, and I had to do a little bit of study here uh, to get this right, you would understand that word overture. So similar to the piece of orchestral music played at the beginning of an opera, ballet, or cantata. And the overture can contain the musical, main musical themes of the work as a whole. In other words, it sets the tone for all the melodies that will follow. Well, friends, verse 3 to 14 sets the tone for the rest of Ephesians. And, and with that in mind, we, have, we ask the question, what is the tone of Paul's letter? Well, let's begin by looking at verse 3, the first half of verse 3. You can read that with me, if you will. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we go down to verse 12, and there we find Paul in response to the hope that believers have in Christ, responding this way, to the praise of his glory. And we go down two more verses to verse 14. And Paul, in response to the glorious grace that he describes in verse 6 of God, who not only seals the believer with the promised Holy Spirit, that's verse 13, and in a day yet to come, in the fullness of time, God well gathers people to himself once for all. And Paul responds to that, to the praise of his glory, verse 14. So what is the tone of Paul's letter? Well, it's praise. It's the praise of God's glorious grace, or as we see in verse 7, the riches of his grace, which God has blessed us, that is the church, in the beloved, in the beloved. So with the heart and mind of praise, Paul here identifies in what way the glorious grace of God is imparted to the believer. So please join me again in verse 3 and read the second half, 3b who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So first, God's blessing for the believer, for the church as a corporate body, is spiritual in nature. Of course, God blesses people, his people with material things as well. But Paul is very clear here and that God's grace is principally and notably spiritual in nature. Nature, And while we may or may not get the material item we're praying for, for the believer, the believer has every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 3. You might be asking, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, this means that the believer today, right now, is experiencing, as Paul said, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, you might ask, how so? Well, there's a number of examples that could be provided to support this, but let me just give you one for an example. Every believer we know from this Bible receives from the Holy Spirit a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts. Upon salvation, upon redemption, upon regeneration, the Holy Spirit embeds uh, and dwells the person and gives them spiritual gifts to be used. Paul's Roman letter said concerning spiritual gifts, he said this, We, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 5 and 6. You can check that out for yourself. See, it's God who distributes the spiritual gifts for why? For what? For why? The edification of the body of Christ. Paul would say this and point this out to us in his first letter to Corinth, where he said, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And that's chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Now, having said this, there's another thing here, another point we don't want to miss in verse 3. And it has really to do with our, with, uh, as I was thinking through our, Christian cultural context here in North America specifically. And it seems to me that people today, many are chasing after spiritual experiences. 
the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, like tongues and healing gifts and stuff like that. And I'll be honest with you, I don't want to give uh, any airtime for the wacky doodle things, which there are many that so-called Christians are chasing after as well today. When we think about the spiritual blessings that Paul was pointing to here in his letter, we see that they're only found in one place. Or should I say only in one person? Notice how Paul puts it for us here in verse 3, this at the end here. Who has blessed us in Christ? And folks, maybe, just maybe we should expend our energies and efforts in getting to know the one who saves us and gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Jesus Christ himself. The author, perfecter, and finisher of our faith. And spend less time chasing after spiritual manifestations beyond what the scripture allows for. Well, we want to move on. We want to move on now to verse 4 and 5. But there's some things that need to be said here. And it's important that I highlight this, I think, at the beginning. Because what, we, what we're dealing with here is something we don't have a lot of luxury to expound on today. We don't have the luxury to expound on the doctrine of election as revealed to us in this text as we have just heard it. Because it's really, it is really difficult for most of us to wrap our heads around this often misunderstood biblical teaching. However, having said that, having said that, the text in reality is not, under, is not hard to understand from God's point of view. And if you believe that the Bible is inspired by God and given to the church and to each believer for their edification and spiritual growth, we need not worry about trying to wrap it all around our minds. So here we go. Let's try and deal with that. So the spiritual blessings the believer has been given in Christ, the triune God had purposed these things according to his will before the foundation of the world. That's what verse 4 tells us. Or as Mounts, Greek scholar Mounts translates it, before the creation of the world. But there's more. The very same triune God, according to verse 4, before the foundation of the world, chose us in him that we should be holy and blameless before him. And according to verse 5, God has predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. I think this is where we get confused, and in doing so, we would miss Paul's teaching here. Because here's what I think, or here's what I, uh, I, I offer to you, that we think that free will means that we get to choose God or not choose God. Well, if we think this way, we don't understand free will from God's point of view. Notice what God chose for those he calls his own in this text. First, he chose that his people would be holy and blameless before him. That's in verse 4. And if you consider the whole scope of the Bible from Old Testament, New Testament, it teaches us uh, uh, correctly and clearly that God is perfectly holy and perfectly just. Therefore, his people are to be, as Leviticus 11.44 put it so well, be holy, for I am holy. Second, notice that God chose his people, according to verse 5, uh, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Now this word sons would include male and female. And that was, according to verse 5, the purpose of his will. So we have here two things that God chose before the creation of the world. Two things that we didn't get to choose, did we? And this brings us back to that question. What do we get to choose? Well, let me take you to John chapter 6, verse 44. And consider what Jesus said there. Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This begs another question. How does God draw people to himself? Well, let's go back to our uh, text here. And specifically in verse 4, the last two words, or the last phrase there, in love. In love. Did you notice that there? 
John, in, his third, in the third chapter of his gospel, writes this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is how God draws people to himself. The Father draws people to himself because of his amazing grace and love. So what do we get to choose then? Well, we get to choose God's love as made manifest in his son Jesus Christ or not. We get to choose God's love as made manifest in the crucified Christ for the forgiveness of sins or not. And when we do repent and choose Jesus, we do so by faith alone. Which, by the way, is also something God has chosen before the foundation of the world to give to you and me. And Paul really highlights this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where he said, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And I would just add the word alone there for now. So there you have it. So, folks, whenever we see the word predestined in conjunction with another word like us or the phrase his purpose or the counsel of his will or phrases and words like this, what they do is describe the things that God has decided, had decided before anything was created, which we weren't then even. And although rather simplified, free will can be seen as expressed by our response to what God has revealed to the world through his son, Jesus Christ, which he has. And God has revealed himself through general, revel general revelation, his creation, and through his specific revelation, the word of God. Well then, friends, this brings us to verse 7 to 10. And here, really, we find... Uh, a first clue or first indication of our place in God's redemptive purposes, that is, in the history of God's redemptive purposes, individually and corporately as a church of, of God's. Notice the in him here at verse 7. The in him referring to the beloved at verse 7. And we ask the question, who is the beloved? Of course, it is Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can say it this way. In Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our trespasses. Verse 7. And friends, friends, here's something else we didn't choose. We didn't get to choose the manner that God would justify the sinner. We don't get to choose that. Yes, the cross has always been an offense to the unbeliever. It is offensive. But we didn't get to choose the manner that God would justify the sinner. For Paul reminds us in his letter to Rome, chapter 5, verse 8, where he said, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And friends, not only did God choose the manner in which he would justify the sinner, unless God revealed his purposes in Christ, it, remain, it would remain to one and all a mystery of his will, verse 9, which is not the use of this term, but that's what would happen. We would not know the purposes of God if he did not reveal it to us. And when we look at this word mystery here, that's used here in this particular uh, verse 9, and then if you think about it in the context of the New Testament, we should know that in the New Testament it does not carry the same meaning as the English word does in our in our language. In the New Testament, it does not imply, as Vine's Dictionary puts it so well, knowledge withheld, but describes truth revealed. And this truth is revealed by none other, no, by, is revealed by, pardon me, by divine revelation, and it's made known by God and known to people by his spirit. And this is what we see here when Paul refers to God's wisdom and insight. And it was because of God's wisdom and insight that he was making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purposes, which he set forth in Christ, verse 8 and 9. And this glorious knowing that we can have of his Christ is because of his amazing grace, or as verse 7 says, the riches of his grace. And because of the riches of his grace, 
it tells us in verse 7, we have redemption through his blood. We have redemption through his blood. Quite a bit of stuff going on here, but hang in there with me. Because there's another question now that we've dealt with verse 7 somewhat. What does it mean we have redemption? Now this word redemption that a believer receives in Christ is a result of two biblical truths. Truths. One, one, redemption is a result of expiation. Expiation. Expiation is a means, by definition, by which atonement or reparation is made. Hence, Christ's death on the cross for the sin of the world, for your sin and my sin, was the means by which atonement was made for sin. Or as Paul put it so succinctly for us here in verse 7, for the forgiveness of our trespasses. The second biblical truth regarding this word redemption, redemption points to the believer's justification. Now, I want to just keep this sweet and short and straight to the point. Justification means the believer's deliverance from the guilt of sin. We are delivered from the guilt of sin and are justified in the sight of God. Because we know what Paul would say in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, uh, 23 and 24. We're justified by grace and it's a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus who has paid the penalty for our sin. Well, folks, I want to just sort of check in with you. How are you doing? How are you doing? <laughs> it's a question I want to ask myself sometimes. Um, uh, who would have thought that base camp required this much effort and work? You know, those little gray cells are really being tested. But really, the truth of the matter is no pain, no gain. You know, because it's really easy today in our time with all sorts of distractions uh, and temptations to fill our days with all sorts of activities and distractions, discover at the end of the day that our spiritual lives are neglected and weakened. I think we, uh, myself too, if I'm not careful, I spend more time uh, doing other things than rather than uh, studying the Bible or uh, building my relationship or investing in my relationship with Christ. The challenge for each of us at base camp is to grasp some things. Grasp with our minds and hearts what the Apostle Paul understood so well. We see this clearly laid out for us in chapter 3. And one day we'll eventually get there and go through that. But considering that, we, have to, we, we need to pray. That's the first thing we need to do. That God will strengthen us with power through his Holy Spirit. We need the strength of the Holy Spirit to make us through these kinds of things that we're trying to learn and, and, and put into implementation in our lives. That Jesus would dwell in our hearts uh, through faith. That we would be rooted and grounded in love. That we would be, uh, have the strength to understand what is the breadth and the length and the heights and the depth. And to know the love of, God, of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what we're doing here at base camp. That is the intention of base camp before we move up towards the summit. Next, uh, as we move into the last few verses here, 11 and on to 14, uh, there's a familiar phrase we start off with in verse 11 in him, and as, verse seven, as with verse 7 in him refers to the beloved who, as we have already decided, is none other than Jesus. So we can put it this way. In Jesus Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. This is amazing. But there's more. And this inheritance was predestined, and there's that word that we were challenged with earlier, a word that means marked out beforehand by the purposes of God. Our inheritance was marked out beforehand by the purposes of God. Um... Uh, who works all these things out, it tells us, Paul tells us here, according to the counsel of his will. God does not need to be told what to do and how to do it. 
Because God is not you or me or any human being. So that begs the question, and what is the purpose of God's will? Well, the text tells us, to hope in Christ. Verse 13, to hope in Christ. And for those who put their hope in Christ and believed him, these are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Verse 13. And this word, this word sealed really has an, uh, an important uh, place to play in, the, uh, in, in this particular teaching here. And it goes like this, but when one puts their faith in Christ, the word sealed marks the certainty and completeness of the act of faith. Once you put your faith in Christ, there is a certainty and completeness to that act of faith that you are sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. In other words, we could say it this way, the deal is sealed. The deal is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Then Paul goes on to say that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee, or to paraphrase, the, the Holy Spirit is a down payment of our inheritance. Verse 14. And the word translated guaranteed here by the SV, which I am using, is used in the New Testament according to uh, of that which is assured by God to believers. So in our context, the assurance of the believers eternal inheritance upon the return of God. Christ. It is, it's money in the bank, so to speak. Guaranteed. Assured. Well, this kind of wraps up these 14 verses. Uh, we, we've done that very fast, I think. Uh, probably too fast. I could have spent some more time over the next couple weeks with these uh, 12 verses. But another, another, nevertheless, we've completed our base camp training for today. And even as our little gray cells were put through the paces, I hope you've noticed just how blessed you are in Christ. God's amazing and rich and glorious grace has blessed us in so many ways. And we see it, we see it in, in a number of ways here in these 12 verses. He's blessed us, for example, one, in Christ. Two, he's marked out beforehand our adoption to himself, to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. It tells us that here. We have the forgiveness of our trespasses. God has made known to us the mystery of his will. We have obtained an eternal inheritance. And we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And friends, one day in God's time, God will redeem his possession. And that possession is the church. You and me as part of that church. What a blessing we have. What spiritual blessings we have in the heavenlies. I just want to close with a quote from John Stott, who said this regarding God's amazing grace towards his people. Quote, grace is God loving, God stooping, God coming to the rescue, God giving himself generously in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for this letter to the Ephesians. And as we've uh, come up and bumped up some things that kind of perplex us sometimes, we just want to surrender uh, all these things to you and thank you that you will help us to walk through this thing again and again until, until we either grow or, or, or some other form of understanding comes to us. So we thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your kindness this day. And uh, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for paying attention. Thank you so much for being inviting me into your places. God bless. Shalom.